Hey, how you doing? So, I'm coming to you from my house this week, just for this little intro, because it actually got way too cold for me to be out in my shed. I have no heating out there, and it doesn't really get to minus six in Ireland very often, but it was all week, and uh, I was like running in and out to the shed, like, uh, to keep myself warm. I couldn't play the bass. You can play the bass when your fingers are frozen, and it was just a disaster, and... Um, because I just kept playing computer games all the time and not being productive so I just packed up all my stuff and I'm in, I'm in here in the spare room and um, if you're watching this on YouTube you might see that I'm in space or something I don't know I haven't decided yet I've got a, br a green screen behind me so I bought this screen fucking ages ago I never used it so um, I said you know what I'll, I'll put it up and the strangest thing happened I've actually played more bass this week and I've played in about a month because I was like, oh, sure, I better learn how to use this green screen. And I started making little beats in um, GarageBand. And then I was writing the bass and then I was finding stupid green screen stuff to put over it. And actually, I was some crack. And I played a lot of bass and made some really nice bass lines and tones. So the, strange, the strangest things can inspire you to play a bit of music. And um, what well, actually was definitely the guest I have on today that I robbed the idea of playing little bass lines with a green screen uh, Josh Paul Josh is like a super bass player and a really positive guy and he's de he's definitely one of my favorite people on Instagram he just put he, his philosophy is just play he just puts up these videos of himself playing like really nice bass parts over beats and they're usually around 20 seconds and you know that that's that's kind of what I want to watch I just want to hear some cool bass playing when I flick on the phone like and um, he's currently the bass player in Daughtry, but he's working on this new project as well at the moment, Zenith Divine. Um, and it's really cool, funk stuff. And he's going to release that album probably this year sometime. But um, anyway, sure, you've heard of me talking enough. Um, so let's just jump in with uh, Josh. And as usual, don't forget to subscribe, share, all that stuff. And um, yeah, hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you're watching on YouTube, you might realize I forgot to change it off gallery mode. So it's it's like switching back and forth between our two faces but i don't think that really affects the chat at all so whatever enjoy it you can understand me anyway my accent's not too thick is it no you just can't talk too fast <laughs> <laughs> you're fucking a native english speaker you should be able to understand <laughs> no man when i was in ireland uh it might have been the uh guinness speaking but oh my goodness i could not i was like I, I speak English and why can't I understand you right now? And then I realized that everyone was speaking to me so fast. And then I, I think they were just doing it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> we do speak fast in fairness. Not even and yeah. faster in different parts. Like, but I think I do speak fast in general. Uh, yours, you're, you're okay for me, at least. I, my brain is actually um, um, accepting and, and computing what you're saying, so it's good. <laughs> uh, well, my voice is quite mellow compared. Uh, my accent is is a lot less because I worked in a factory when I was like 18 for like four okay. years for three years, and it was mainly foreign people like Polish and Slovakian and Lithuanian. And I literally couldn't uh, do my job. I spoke the way I normally spoke because <laughs> I didn't understand. Right? <laughs> They're like it was Got like it. a pharmaceutical factory, and they they wouldn't have had a clue what I was saying otherwise. Uh. Had to mellow it out a bit, and I think that that yeah. might have stuck after I finished the job. Nice. Well, sounds sounds great. It wasn't <laughs> great. It was fucking terrible. <laughs> it was the shittest job ever. I, I, I'm trying. I'm trying to keep positive. <laughs> you no, know, it's good. But I can be positive now. Like if I was still in the factory, that was nearly yeah. 15 years ago. If I was still there now, oh god, but right. I would not be positive. <laughs> it a gray hair and just be. I have gray hair time. already, but I don't. That's probably no. from teaching kids bass. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny, man. Well, cheers. What are you drinking? Uh, it's a uh, tea. Oh, just, nice. Just, uh, we love tea in Ireland. We drink the second most tea per capita in the world. Uh, really? After Turkey, yeah. The okay. Turks have us be. They love the tea just that bit more than the Irish. Nice. Next, next time I go, I'm gonna have to drink some tea. Yeah, so you made it over to Ireland. When was that? One one time. Uh, probably three years ago, four years ago, maybe. Yeah. Just a it was a good, word. It was, it was a gigging or anything? No, no. We were gigging. We played in Dublin, and we played uh, one more one more place. It was a UK run. So mm -hmm. it was um, it was a lot of fun, though. I mean, I, I, I typically 
don't walk around and cruise around by myself. But that day, I just walked around the city really? and just made a bunch of new friends. It was cool. <laughs> you had a few got, points got, Guinness as well, that's it. I did. I did. And that's probably the reason I don't drink anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Went right through you. <laughs> it did. It did. It was fun. Everybody was very cool and kind and funny. It was it was you know, awesome. You don't really see much when you're on tour anyway. Like it's you don't have the energy. Like it, you're just sleeping, yeah. gigging, try to eat something good, but you don't get right. to see very rarely. Like Yeah, I've been touring for so long and for actually too long I, I didn't take advantage of the places that I was going to. Um so I may I've made a point the last probably five years to really get out and see stuff. Really, you, you I, make an effort. Like I, 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 I think re- Leland Scar was saying, he does that as well. You know the the big beard session. Yeah, yeah. He was saying something similar. He makes himself go out and see stuff. Yeah, it's important because I, you know, I'll be talking to my kids and they say, "Dad, have you been here? Have you been here?" And I was like, "Uh, yeah." Yeah, I think so, but I didn't really see much. And that, <laughs> you know, part of that is just due to logistics, but yeah. the other part of that is just me not wanting to get off the bus or get, you know, even if it's for 20 minutes. So I, be, I really... tired, like, you know, you'd be wrecked. It's hard to yeah. so, get the energy. Yeah. But I do try to make the point now. Cool. Uh, and what, any cities in particular that you liked on the last few tours? Oh, uh, let's see. Well... There are a lot of cities in the states that that I like. I I went out in New Orleans and I got a beignet, which I've been in New Orleans a million times, but yeah, I me, typically I was there once. great city, brilliant. Yeah, I typically just try to stay in and stay away from all the uh, partying and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I did go out and and get some food. That was cool. Uh, Dublin, I went out and and it was really cool to just wander the, the city by myself. Got a tattoo and I got um, really. Nice one. Yeah. Irish tattoo in Ireland. <laughs> yeah. And uh, let's see. Love Australia. I went to Bangkok and I spent some time there just wandering around too. That was really cool. Hmm. So it was cool. good. Yeah, I had a good yeah. time in New Orleans. We we, we we had a few drinks. And we went to this bar called the Apple Barrel. It's on Bourbon Street. Okay. It's tiny. Nice. And it's just run by this grumpy old woman. She's like smoking a cigarette and... People are like, can I get a, can I get a beer? And she's just like ignoring them till she finished her cigarettes. <laughs> so me and the drummer stayed there all night, and we became like regulars. They loved us. So yeah. then this this drunk big mustard guy comes in and he pulls on the drummer our drummer's beard, and like we were like, oh, it's okay, it's not a big deal. But the regulars were not having any of it, so they took out like a bat with barbed oh. wire in it. And then, like, we're going to hit your man with it. We were, like, trying to defuse the situation. Oh, my goodness. People pull our beers all the time. It's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Wow. So That was good. That that shit happened, you know. It was was good fun. We got home alive. That's what we always say. That's the main thing. 100%. Healthy and happy. With with a story to tell. (laughs) Yeah. Just the touring stories are are important. I'm just going to throw this dog Yeah. He's like, usually he's quiet, but then you go live on air and he starts giving out. Yeah, mine was just peeking through the window crying, and I was hoping that she wouldn't cause a ruckus. So, yeah, you've been touring for a long time, though. Like, So I can understand how you, you like to stay on the bus. Like, You have you started when you were like five, was it, on the drums? I did. Uh, you know, at that age, I'm pretty much just banging on things on beat. But I did. I was able to keep time on um, my... I had my grandfather and my parents who really encouraged me to uh, just play. And my grandfather told me, you know, you can play any instrument that I have here because he played every instrument as long as you treat it right and you don't bang on it. So I would get in there and make noise. And he didn't complain once. We lived with with my grandparents. So uh, he just encouraged me. And I think I played my first gig with him, he had a Dixieland band and he would play down in this marina in Los Angeles. And I got to sit in with the band and they put up my little drum kit next to the drummer in their band. And I just played along, which, you know, I, looking back on that is truly amazing. And it, and it allowed me to, um, number one, gain confidence 
and uh, performance, but it was just developing my love for music. That's that's such a class memory to have. Like at the time, obviously you weren't realizing it was unique, but not many people yeah. have a memory like that with their granddad just playing music. Right. And, you know, as we get older, you look back on things like that. And just like you said, uh, you may not see it for what it is in the moment, but uh, it's a beautiful memory for sure. Golden. Well, uh, at least these days, um, I never even heard of the word mindful until like in recent times. At least people are a little bit more aware of things now. You're, I suppose it's because of the smartphones and we're, we're always aware that we're not in the moment. So we kind of, yeah. tr- we all, I think, well, I hope so. You try to be a bit more mindful these days. Like you have kids and everything. So I'm sure you have lots of these memories where you're like try and live in the moment or on tour if something amazing is happening. Sometimes you, you have to just stand back and go like, wow, I can't believe this. Yeah, you know, and I think part of the, the issue or, or one of the contributing factors is not having these physical sort of pieces of memories to be able to touch if that makes any sense, you know, you have, you have pictures on your phone, but you can't feel them physically. And it, and it, and it almost is a disconnect in a way because everything's so accessible just to look at, but a a photo you can actually touch, you know, and it brings back memories and it, and you can even like a smell, I don't know, at least for me, even, and that's why I like um, records and and CDs because you can actually, it, it just feels like it's real. Yeah, as opposed yeah. to as opposed to getting on iTunes or something like that on your phone, which is very convenient. It's awesome to mm-hmm. have it right there. But I still love looking through the CDs and and you know reading credits on an album while you listen yeah. to it. I get that with like the base magazine to have a stack of them here, and I get such a nostalgia from them. I'm like I remember this exact every one I can remember when I was a teenager buying that issue and who's on the cover and. The exercises yeah. in it and everything. I wish that I kept all of mine. I don't know where they are. See, I made that mistake, but um, I, I completely agree with you. I do love going into, you know, any sort of bookshop or magazine thing. And I still look through all those magazines. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So it's just to have that physical thing. You just can't beat it. But uh, you, you did like yeah. a thing with, uh, you were on like Don Henley's music video, The Boys of the Summer playing the drums yeah i looked it up today yeah. it's like that's and i was thinking actually this song has a cool bass line as well <laughs> it's real you know you know who that was no pino Paladino. oh really i was thinking yeah it's the 80s it's fretless has chorus on it <laughs> yeah that's yeah the pino. he's amazing i can't even it's like god status i yeah. love his playing oh yeah, yeah. I, my friend i have a friend philip mcgee he's like one the most one of the most in-demand music producers in ireland and um, I asked him once, who is, who do you think is the best bass player? Or who, who would you have on a session? And without a hesitance, he just like, Pino. He could choose yeah. anyone alive or dead. Pino. So there you go. Yeah. It's, he's fantastic. I, like I said, <laughs> I had no words. Always no. picks the right notes. Always gets the right sounds. Everything. Oh, yeah. His feel and everything is just truly amazing. And do you remember much from recording that video where you were so young? It's just. So I was seven years old. I remember auditioning for it. Uh, my wife is coming by to say hello. She says hello, by the way. Oh, She's no. waving through the window. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I remember auditioning and there were, you know, I think it was a, I guess you can consider it a cattle call. You know, there's a, just a million kids there, open call. And then I remember them telling me I got the gig. I got the uh, job. Next thing I remember is kind of being on set and then I see, I think I still do it, but when I concentrate, I have a tendency to stick out my tongue and I, it's a, I don't know why I've done it ever since. Bass face before you played the bass. Yes, exactly. (laughs) So that's my concentrating thing. You know, I'm like sticking my tongue out, moving it around and all this stuff. So I remember them telling me, put your tongue back in your mouth, put your tongue back in your mouth. (laughs) So, so in that video, really, I look so serious and, and, you know, kind of cool, I guess, uh, with my hair all done up. But what I was focusing on was trying to stay on beat and keeping my tongue in my mouth. (laughs) So that's what I remember from that. But Don Henley was a, a, 
a very cool person uh, to me and my family. He was inspirational and motivational for me to get interested in songwriting. And um, he was so real about and honest about the um, process. He said, you know, you got to play something other than drums. Really, if you want to make any money in this and, and stay around, you got to write songs. You got to really? be involved. He gave you that, that advice song. at that young age. He, was... he did. Yeah. That's cool. Um, he was very cool. He took, he took me and my mom to New York for the video awards. Uh, I think around 1985, it won video of the year on MTV. So I got to go to that. And, you know, awesome. what kid gets to do that? It's like, I can't even believe it. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and you kind of did a bit of acting after well you, you, you did what some something with the ferris bueller movie you were his yeah brother. yeah well originally there was a little brother and a little sister and i was the little brother but for some reason we got cut out probably time factors or something but i did shoot the movie so i i can uh, you know <laughs> got that under my belt <laughs> would you still be on imdb even if you aren't in the film Take you probably are somewhere <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I haven't checked it out. Extras I'll or have something. To look that up. DVD extras yeah. when they used to be around. You know what? I think somebody mentioned to me that they did mention my name, talking about the unedited version of it or something. Could be some residuals there, some good <laughs> DVD. I, 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 I doubt it, but I'm going to pray. <laughs> uh, was the music with you all the time? Like, were you shedding on the drums? Or did you, when Don told you, you got to play something else? Is that when you started branching out of the drums? Yeah. Uh, see, well, we moved into an apartment, so you can't really play drums in an apartment. So no. my grandfather let me use one of his basses. So I picked that up, and I we had this. Uh, I have a twin sister who was a singer, so she had a karaoke machine. So I didn't have an amp or anything. So I plugged into this karaoke machine with my bass, and I would just play along the tapes nonstop. And so do you remember what the that, bass was, what brand it was? Oh, my, I'm, man, we didn't have any money. So he had... <laughs> Could be not anything. He, yeah, he had a... Um, it must have been a, a Gibson, maybe a Ripper, but it didn't... Looking back on it, it didn't really look like that. But my mom bought me my first one because that was too big for me. My hands were too small. So... Uh, she bought me a Hyundai bass, which, you know, like the car company, I didn't know they even made bases. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I think she bought it for like 50 bucks or something like that. And uh, that's where I started playing uh, the bass in the apartment. So it just went on from there. And was it all bass from then on? It was like, oh, I finished with the drums and it's bass. Yeah. Yeah. Once I started playing the bass, you know, first of all, they're closely related. But second of all, it was so much easier to just get around and, and be able to practice and you know, my, my family we moved around a lot so all i had to do is just pick up the bass and carry it with me and do you remember the, the first few bands you were in or what age you were when you started to like start jamming with uh, my sister and i played our first gig we had a little band together so we played our first gig i think we were 12 and we played at this place in Venice, California called Snow's Oasis. And it was a little bar and we were writing our own songs, but we really wanted to just play gigs. So uh, my mom took me into this place and I begged the owner to let us play. Tiny little stage, tiny. And he did. He let us play and we you made were, 200 you were bucks. at a young age. <laughs> hustling for the yeah, gig. but you know what? You know, it's funny. We didn't know any cover songs. So we had to learn like 30 cover songs in a month to be able to do this little gig and we made flyers and it was really cool from then on uh we played i think the troubadour and we both had separate little things going on i started a couple of funk bands in early high school and uh we ended up opening up for fishbone and malibu Inn type stuff weapon of choice and all this stuff and then then later on it was um suicidal so right out of high school. You got the gig in Suicidal? Yeah. Really? Uh, yeah, so you were 18 when you got that gig. It was because Robert Trujillo, just, he moved on to Ozzy. Was that, that was pretty much it. Yeah, so uh, Brooks Wackerman, drummer, I don't know if you know who that is. Um, no. 
he played in Suicidal and Infectious, and he was playing in Infectious Crews. He's my age, maybe about a year older than I am, but we had played in bands uh, in L.A., kind of, in, you know, same peer of, of people. We would open up for each other and do stuff. And uh, he was playing with Infectious Crews. And when Robert left, we knew each other. So he recommended me. I went in there. I didn't have any other gigs really before that, you know, at that level, especially. That's amazing gig to get. And then, and then, you know, some punk kid walking in trying to replace Robert Trujillo was like, oh my <laughs> God, for me, I was, I was shitting my pants, excuse my French, but, um, ended up getting the gig and doing that. And it was a you know, very memorable, um, teaching experience for me. I got to cut my teeth. Yeah, I was listening. What was have a, I was listening today and um, just having my notes here. What was the album? It was uh, oh on the Freedom al- al- album, and it was listen to a track yeah. called Scream Out, and you you do like yes. a Jacko run, kind of Jacko esque run, and then back to crazy stuff. A little bit, <laughs> right? You know, well, when I was a kid, when I was learning how to play, um, my mom got me a Jacko video. Oh, I so, know the one, yeah, yeah. He's wearing like yeah, a, a jumper yes. and he does your yes. man is giving him his bass and all this. Right. Uh so I, I learned a lot of stuff from that and then some flea videos and then um so all of that stuff were influential on my playing. And, but uh yeah, yeah, that that little run was uh on all that stuff, I didn't really know if if Mike was gonna dig it or or you know if it was going to stick, but, um, he was, he just said, dude, you gotta be you put in what you're doing. Come on, yeah. you can, let's go do this, do this more and more and more. And that really fueled the fire for me. So it was yeah, cool. There's a lot of bass breaks. It's on. cool to have that. You're getting a lot of moments to shine in that band. It's class and your chops are ferocious. So yeah. you must've been in the shade. <laughs> oh, thank you, man. Thank you. I was, I was, I, Every day I learned something new and, and if I was hearing something and I wanted to be able to do something, I wouldn't stop until I was able to do it or at least halfway do it. <laughs> <laughs> and you never had a kind of an imposter syndrome like, oh, I shouldn't be in this band or were you at that young age, like it's very hard to, to fill those boots. Yeah. Um again, Mike was um motivating me to to become my own sort of um i guess man number one Mm. but i did have boots to fill so i had to be it wasn't going to be robert's replacement i had to be this is jp this is josh paul you know what i'm saying if that makes any sense and and being so young sorry similar to when jason replaced cliff he didn't replace him he did his own thing and that's the way it worked. Right. Yeah. And and being so young, you know, I was a little bit insecure, but then I was so determined to just because I love I loved Robert. I've always loved Robert. And he was, you know, growing up listening to him and the infectious stuff. I was like, oh my God. So um I didn't have any what the best way to put it is is uh I, I looked up to him. But I needed to be me. Yeah, yeah, that, and you were bringing that jazzy so, sensibility to the song, so you totally were being you, like. Right. It was fun. It was a lot of fun, and each record and each gig that I did, you know, I got better and better. Uh, so I was able to playing with Brooks Wackerman was amazing because uh, we heard, I think, just naturally a lot of the same things. And uh, he's such a great drummer. He's fire. You should check him out for sure. Yeah, I think he plays with uh, he plays with the Venge Sevenfold now. Oh, great! It's a great gig to get. Yeah, but I think what makes you yeah. different, and I love your stuff on um, social media. Actually, I only joined Instagram about two years ago, two or three years ago, and um, you were one of the first people. Okay, I don't know how you just popped up as a suggested person to follow, like. So. But the stuff you put up nice. is brilliant. But um, you're really crazy. High five! <laughs> <laughs> you're um, you lean. You're you're busy with the songwriting, though. You're not, you know, you're you don't just play the bass. You're really in. You, you yeah. do a lot of work in the songwriting as well, don't you? Like, yeah. Um, 
I like to be as creative as I can. And there are a lot of guys who are just all about chops and um, I respect that as well. But for me, I'm, I'm really into just creating a vibe or a moment, even if it's 20 seconds of something, just something kind of cool. And um, it works for me. You know, I, I just, sometimes I'll hashtag this thing, just play. Yeah. And that's what I'm doing. You know, that's what I, mean? I like I what just you're doing. Get on there. I, anyone else that would just swipe away is like, oh, some ferocious thing that has no musicality. But your ones always are like a little right. 20 second mi- song or something. Oh, I appreciate that, man. Um, But, you know, those Shredder guys, too, they're they're amazing and they're worthy of, of every single second of acclaim that they get. Oh, but yeah. for me, I just enjoy. Yeah, I, I just enjoy. Um, making music and if i can do something cool with my instrument my preferred instrument of choice um let's do it yeah but it's about your own voice like i've had um another guest on uh carl and he does solo bass that's all he does just puts up bass versions of famous songs just playing on his own the melody oh cool and the chords so it's all about just doing what what is you really isn't it like whatever you are comfortable yeah with. Yeah, and the wonderful thing about social media, media, excuse me, is that like Instagram, for instance. I mean, you can just put whatever you want up. There's no yeah. record company that you have to deal with. There's no, there's nothing um, holding you back. Anybody can put up whatever they want if they want to make. Like for me, if I want to do a metal song at the moment, I'm going to do a metal song at the moment, whether it's you know five minutes or ten seconds. So it's so free. Yeah, when you got your green screen recently, you look like you're having good fun with it. You're just like crazy. It's like <laughs> I have been. I'm still trying. To, yeah, I'm still trying to learn how to use it and getting the. Uh, I guess there's a lot of issues with shadowing that you have to deal with, yeah. and I'm not quite familiar with yet. But I'm getting there. I saw one the other day, and I was thinking he's after drinking a lot of coffee. <laughs> you were just going for it on the base, and it was all <laughs> twirling around. <laughs> Yeah, man, you know, uh, I do have a coffee addiction, I'd say. <laughs> but uh, was the the interest in songwriting <laughs> part of your reason to move to Nashville, away from L.A., like, that you wanted to be close to that yeah. scene? Yeah, um, I came here uh, probably, f- I guess, just about five years ago, almost five years ago. And I ended up doing some writing here one time, and I brought my wife with me. And she liked it. I liked it. We were living in Central California at the time. And we were, I was considering going back to Los Angeles or somewhere else. And I had never lived in any other state. So I said, let's go to Nashville. She said, okay. And that's what we did. <laughs> so uh, I came here and uh, actually guitar player Brian moved here as well. And then Chris Daughtry actually lives here now too. So Brian and I, had uh, teamed up and done some songwriting sort of production stuff together for some artists called co-op. And that's the thing that we put together and uh, we do things separately as well. Just writing for other people in sessions. He has a studio called the cat room, um, which he does a lot of stuff through. And it's been really good. I've, I've done some country stuff. I've done some rock stuff um, and I've made a lot of friends here. And the thing that I love about it is just this musical community. It doesn't really matter the genre, at least for me and, yeah. and my friends, you know. So everybody cool. sort of is just here for music. So yeah. The move has been good. You like the, the vibe in Nashville with all, with all the songwriting and music. Yeah. As on that end, for sure. For sure. I do miss the beach. I do miss <laughs> sort of the laid back vibe uh, of California. But uh, I do like the music thing here. I haven't seen the sun in a while. Not since I was in Spain back in March. In our, it's a bit overcast in Ireland. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, isn't it always like that? Kind of? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. What can you do? You're going to have to get your sun sun lamp. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A sad lamp or something. But uh, you, you, yeah. how is it? You've been doing a lot of um, writing during this kind of downtime. You've got some cool projects. Kind of, you have a few things going. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, the touring thing was basically trashed. um, And that was uh, 
it was an interesting feeling um, because I didn't really know, number one, in the beginning of it, how long it was going to last. Then it, it was just on and on and on. So I was like, what the hell am I going to do? So I just started writing and uh, recording stuff at home. I put out a few songs on my own, just kind of singing. And I thought, why not? And, yeah. and I had all this inspiration coming on and I was producing some stuff. And then I ended up um, laying down some funk stuff, like some sort of throwback, like maybe late 70s, early 80s funk, which I really like a lot of that hip hop stuff. And um, so I posted a few things on Instagram and uh, Doobie Duke Sims was in a band called Shinobi Ninja. Uh, sent me a message saying, dude, I love what you're doing. I would love to write to this. So I didn't really know him very well. So I kind of waited on it for a second. But then I sent it to him. And because uh, I completely, it just spaced. And I sent it to him. And he sends back just this killer vibe, exactly what I was thinking it should be. And really, now we have uh, 13 songs done. It's called uh, Zenith Divine. The record is finished. I wanna, I'm looking for a place to put it out properly. We have a video working on the second one. Um, I was hoping to find some sort of niche, kind of small, funk, grimy label to put it out on. Or otherwise, I'll just put it out myself. You know, there are a lot of um, uh, distribution platforms that you can put it out on. Yeah, the, the art I'm excited really about cool. it. I love anyway. it. The t-shirt looks class. I was loving the art that you have for, for Zenith Divine. You, you know, yeah, uh, Doobie, he's all about that stuff. He has a, a print shop and everything. He's an artist. He's really uh, kind of a jack of all trades. He's talented, you know, singer and guitar player and writer and uh, does a lot of hip hop stuff. So I'm, I'm grateful to be working with him. And it was kind of just you and him it, it was, sending ideas back and forth. That's how the whole album came together. You're you're playing every instrument. You're, are you drumming on it? Or? Yeah, I so I programmed everything. I played, you know, all the keys and and made all the beats and the bass. I played some guitar. He played some guitar, and then he played some drums, live drums on there. And uh, I think he played saxophone on one thing. And so it's it's cool just. Rolling there are no rules like yeah we're the way the way we're working is you know i'll send him something he sends it back it is what it is no discussion sounds good to me here's the vibe let's go and that really opens up all of these doors so you're not limited you know what i'm saying a lot of times if you people get so wrapped up and oh my god we have to do this otherwise won't be successful or oh i mean there are a lot of different ways you can measure success, I think. Mm. So this is probably the um, most free that I've felt in creating. And I think you'll be able to hear it when you, when you check it out. It's a lot of fun. And really, the vibes on this are just all about positivity and good vibes. There's no negativity on all the stuff. So it's, Yeah, I can tell you're excited. I mean, the, the the, we did release... A, yeah, we we did um, kind of preview three songs called "Party in the Park," so that's what it is. It's party, you know, it's party music. <laughs> and how are you finding singing it? Would you be would you sing and play the bass like often, or are you more used to singing well, away from the bass? He, he well, he's uh in this project, yeah, Gina Divine. Or he's singing on this the guitar. He's singing in general. He, how do you find singing and playing the bass? Oh man. So it depends on the bass part. Like Sting can do that, you know, all those crazy syncopated things and all this stuff and sing those beautiful lines. And I'm not great at that. I can sing a lot of backgrounds. I guess I can sing some lead stuff playing bass, but for the way that I really want to play, I'm still practicing on getting the lead down with being able to play it, you know. Have you ever checked out Glenn so, Hughes live? You know Glenn Hughes. He, he is yes, a, yes. He is amazing. Obviously, singer and yeah. playing the bass. He just has that independence down. You know who else is? Uh, Marco Mendoza. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah, yeah. His stuff. Oh, he does this Latin 
project. I can't remember the name of it, but the way he's playing and singing all the stuff is like, wow, crazy. Yeah, I'm a terrible singer, so there's no point in me practicing my independence of singing in the face. <laughs> no one wants to hear it. You know what? I don't, I, don't, um, I don't particularly love singing. I'd much rather play bass and jump on the microphone when I need to. But for the stuff that I released and, you know, all the songs that I've been writing, it was more about just, all right, this is what I want to say right now. This is more out of like necessity. I'm here. No other singers here right now. So I'm just going to do it. Yeah. Why not? And I, some, not, some I, wouldn't, of, you know. I wouldn't think you're much of a gearhead, though, are you? You don't post much pictures of gear and that stuff. I'm not. I'm not. No. I try to keep it as simple as possible. And most of that is is due to me just being um ignorant of a lot of uh technical stuff but i get you know the stuff that i do i think i do well for what i have and what i know <laughs> yeah you get the sound you want you have a lot of endorsements like so you probably could get a showered in pedals if you wanted but you're not yeah well all the pedal yeah the all the pedals that i have and stuff for are uh, mxr and dunlop which um they're awesome I love all their stuff and they send me stuff and um, I have a Aguilar tone hammer that I use a lot and I have a dark glass vintage deluxe. That sounds really cool too. Yeah. It's great. Brian. And then, um, um, so on, on that end, yeah, I love to play with pedals and I'm just whatever, whatever I can use to create the vibe that I'm feeling at that moment. You know, and you I know there are a lot the of, base, of other, like Sorry, do you have a preference for the type of bass that you might use? Or yeah, well, I love this Sandberg bass that they just let me use. Um, I've been playing that a lot lately, and uh, I like I love jazz basses and and the Warwicks that I have are awesome as well. So I'm just um, find still finding a voice, you know. I think it all really stems from from the way that I grew up. You know what I mean? Like not having any money and just having to play what's in front of me, whether it be that $50 bass that my mom got me and, and making it work, you know? That's cool. Yeah, so. you, you can get a difference. I, I have a lot of crappy basses and some expensive ones, but I'll pick the crappy one sometimes if I want a certain sound, you know, or to be even restricted. Like so. Yeah, well... I have this... Uh, I'm I'm involved with this project with this producer... Uh, a good friend of mine, great human being, Jakir King. And he has a thing called the K Club, which uh, we will be releasing stuff soon. It's a very cool project. And we get in and um, we record everything live. And it's a lot of instrumental stuff. There's some vocals on there as well. But on some of that stuff, I used a, um, a Univox bass. Oh, like yeah, weird looking kind of, Yeah, weird thing. And and it's it sounded so cool. It's not the most expensive bass in the world, but it sounded so cool and it worked for what what I needed for that moment. Yeah. So it was great. And that kind of tumpy. Do you play short scales? Everyone seems to be getting into them at the moment. Yeah, I have one of the uh the Mustangs, the Justin Johnson um, oh, yeah. cool. Mustang basses, which is really cool, some flat ones on there. It's really cool. Yeah, I've got the Alan Woody um Charge scale. He used to be in the Almond Brothers, and he made a, a yeah. bass with Epiphone. And it just sounds amazing. It's like kind of like a hollow body Les Paul shaped thing, and really cool sound. Okay, I have a Jack Cassidy that I oh, love. Yeah. As I actually well. played one of them before. Yeah, I was on I was on tour in America, and I got um, I got a lend of one. So, it, and you didn't call me. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, he's, I didn't know. Next time I will. I didn't make it to Nashville or LA, but. Yeah. We, drove, we did drive from Texas to New Orleans in one go. That was, <laughs> I wasn't going to call anyone after that. I, I remember my first tour, I was, we were driving through Texas and literally I, I felt like I was in Texas for two weeks, just driving through. <laughs> it's so big. <laughs> but, but the filling stations are amazing. We went but, yeah. to Bucky's. There's a place called Bucky's. It's like, one of, it has to be the biggest state filling station in the world. We went in and we're like, this can't be real. They're like selling a crossbows and the beef jerky. The beef jerky stand was like a oh mile yeah, long. yeah. And you could buy all your souvenirs there. You the truck stops, everything. man. 
and what's that VHS place? VHS tapes, Waff- everything. Yeah. Everything at Waffle House. Waffle House. Or Awful yeah. House, as they were calling it. But I actually was loving it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You either love it or you hate it. I don't particularly like it, but... Uh, must have been the night. I have friends that... <laughs> yeah. But that's it. The tour food. Oh, cheers, I- man. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, I'll have one of these. I think these days I try to eat a bit better, like, if I'm on tour, like, you just feel like shit, so you try and get something. Yeah. You know what, man? During this um, this whole pandemic thing, I have just been eating and eating and eating and eating and eating. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get out of this house. Really, I got to yeah. get out of the house. Let's go play some shows, man. <laughs> no, I can't wait to – I really can't wait to uh, get back out on tour, and uh, I, I – I want to do a tour with Zena Divine. That music is going to be so much fun to play. Hmm. Yeah, you'll have to get a, dr- a drummer. Would you do it as a three piece or would you get a bigger band together? Uh, no, I'm going to put together a bigger band. We're going to do keys. We're going to do a drummer. Um, uh, Timmy plays guitar. Um, and uh, who knows, maybe a horn section even. I'm not sure. Cool. Daughtry is supposed to go back out at some point as well um you know everything's up in the air at the moment but so i'm just it'll crossing my up. fingers yeah it'll start it'll open up when it yeah. opens up you can't rush it like what but you're being creative like so you couldn't be doing anything better really with with your time right and you know sometimes i'll second guess myself and and then my wife will remind me you're doing everything you can do yeah. so really that that feels like she's patting me on the back and rubbing <laughs> my the back of my neck like a puppy and then i scratch my ear and i'm all happy again so it's good <laughs> but um you're getting to spend a lot of time at home with the family like which is probably unusual to spend such a extended period at home that's great this is the most time i've spent at home and it's been amazing um my son who is uh 17 he's a senior he'll be graduating uh next year but he's going into the air force in June or July. So we've gotten really close this year. You know, um, I can, I can say that I'm extremely, um, well, what's a better way to put this? You know, my wife has, has, uh, been with the kids just nonstop, you know, since they were born and I've been gone quite a bit. And when I get home, I'm sort of like the Disneyland dad, maybe where you're, you're like, oh, dad's home. Okay, guys, let's go here. Let's go here. Let's do this. And then she's like, okay. But um, <laughs> but being home, you know, getting them ready for school and, and uh, being able to hang out with them all day long has just been awesome. Awesome. And do they play music, any of the kids? Uh, the, the little guys love to play. They're learning. Uh, my 17-year-old Brandon, he's more of a techie guy and sports guy so he's not so much into the music but my oldest son is really into music and he's really good at programming beats and all these this type of stuff too yeah well, that's what it's about these days isn't it like the beat making is is the new, yeah. new way totally but uh you've had i think you've had an intro a kind of a different career path like you've you've done a lot of genres and you've been like in a bunch of different, you did like session work. You used to play with Kelly Osborne and things like that as well, didn't you? Yeah, I've done, I've been fortunate to have been able to do a lot of different things. And, um, and as, as a, my adult life, this is what I've done is, is uh, being a professional musician. And I think, you know, everyone that I've ever worked with is, you know, enabled me to continue to do this and support my family. Um, one of the things I, I really am thankful for uh, was my grandfather exposing me and my mom exposing me to all sorts of music and stressing the importance of appreciating every type of music. And I think that helped me in being able to sort of sneak in and sit in and maybe fit in with a, a few different genres and not stick out like a sore thumb so much. <laughs> Well, would you, would you, that's probably what helps you on your way, just keeping an open mind. And I think you were probably never afraid to move on when you felt that kind of frick, t- when it was time to move. Like you made that move to Nashville, but there was something subconsciously telling you it was probably time to. Yeah. Try that. Uh, I, th- 
I think there have been times where uh, I've been a little bit too safe, and there have been times where I was maybe overconfident. I guess that might be the word, but I don't regret any of the decisions that I've made on making moves, you know? So otherwise you're just sitting in one spot and it gets a little bit stale. Yeah. So that's good advice for any bass players. Listen, you know, don't be afraid to take a risk. It, it is yeah. hard to leave a project that's going well, but if you're, yeah. if you're getting that feeling that it's time to move on, it probably is. Right. And I, I would say, you know, especially now, no matter what situation that you're in, um, just create and just play. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't, say no to a lot of different things i would just say yes and collaborate mm. and you know positivity is key and i think that that really generates creativity you know when you're staying positive and, and you're showing gratitude it really fills the spirit of creativity yeah and as well i think these days like back in the day you could either get in a famous band or be a session player in another band but these days you can just create your own path yeah. online and be like the guy who puts up really good stuff online. People get into that and then you get work. So there right. is, there's and, more opportunities. Yeah. And, it, and you know, do it all. Why? Why not? Yeah. Why not? Like just do it all. It's for, What time is it over here? It's like 11 o'clock. It's, it's pretty early to be doing one of these things probably. <laughs> yeah. It's 11, uh, 49, 11 50. Uh, it's, it's ten to six here. Not too bad. Yeah, oh, that's not bad. Yeah, I was just hanging out. Just visit my father there. I'm from a farm, like so. We're just, I was just out on the farm, seeing what the what the story was. How? Like, that are good. Life hasn't changed too much. They're just doing farming things. <laughs> yeah, is that uh? How far away do you live from your father? Oh, like ten minutes from my parents. Okay, that's not bad. No, I still live in like a little small town in Ireland, like ten thousand people, twenty thousand people. So. I'll have to come visit. <laughs> yeah, man. Do any time. Ireland is tiny, actually. I did uh, an Instagram video with this guy in China in China years ago, about two years ago. And yeah. then I was in London last year on tour and I got a message from him and he was like, Man, I'm in London. Do you wanna hang out? Now he didn't realise I was in London, but he, he just saw like on the map Ireland and England were so small. So cl- and close he was like yeah we should hang out i'm from china right to me relatively you're not far away from me <laughs> i was like actually i am in london but um i have to go in an hour so we won't get to hang out ah that's but, uh, right that is fun like doing those clubs with these random people yeah and you know this kind of stuff makes it so much easier to do it technology and social media and it's really cool to be able to i i think that going back to you know just positive vibes and stuff like that it, as long as you're remaining um positive and supporting each other it all works out it's great yeah you, well that's probably one of the keys to being a successful musician being positive because no one wants to spend 15 hours in a stinking van with someone who's going to be right <laughs> right and well and and you know i've been on both sides of that you know i've gone through some hard times where it's you know maybe not having a good month or day or whatever and i was the asshole excuse my language yeah and then i've been around other people as well so everybody's got their good days and bad but i i have realized that um yeah you want to be the the guy who who brings the light (laughs) (laughs) you you don't want to you don't want to darken up the room no with with bad vibes you yeah. have to be resilient and to know when you're having a bad week, maybe Abs- keep it to yourself or something. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it can always get worse yeah, than it is. Luckily, I've never, I've never actually been sick on tour, but um, my bandmates have, and I'd say that must be horrible acting to just sing and play and be in, do all these things while you're not feeling physically well. Yeah, and you know, you have to just put on that face. And there's some days like. I mean, you don't even have to be feeling ill. You can just be feeling unmotivated or just like um, bored or just having a crappy day. You know, your dog could have died at home or something like that. And uh, 
you still got to get up there and put on that face and smile and talk to people. And, but that's our job. And, you know, what helps me is people have asked me before, you know, does it ever get old? You know, people asking for pictures or anything like that, or maybe for you to sign an autograph or something like that. And I, I really have to say that, uh, I'm just happy that people would even want my autograph or to take my picture. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, wow, you really want yeah. my autograph? Oh, okay. Because <laughs> if nobody wanted to talk to you or nobody wanted it, you know, pictures and autographs are one thing. But if nobody even wanted to talk to you, that would suck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'd be in a bad situation. A pariah yeah. in music world. Don't fucking talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But so, yeah, no, I've been but... to Spain. I think they, they, those people in Spain are just amazing when it comes to live music, and they embody that enthusiasm. Oh yeah, have you ever been to um, like Japan or no, any, no. anywhere in Asia? Okay, no. so Europe, uh, they're they're great and very um, energetic, and Asia as well. I mean, and then they're so respectful. So you play a song and they go crazy for a second, and then it's dead silence. But, and it's mostly because they're just trying to be respectful and, and trying to hear what you're saying. And so I think, but the energy is just killer. I love it. It reminds me of that film by Anvil. Have you seen that? Yes. And I, like, I don't, I probably will spoil the ending, but at the end, when they're in Asia playing, it's just, it nearly, it nearly made me cry, like, because seeing them finally be successful. Yeah. Again, we're again. back. <laughs> <laughs> we're back, yeah 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 oh man i gotta watch that again i haven't seen it in a while there was too many points in the film that were like are my own life and probably your life you know they're getting paid in goulash and he's like i don't want the the goulash just pay me and like, yeah oh, i've yeah. been there we've all been eating the goulash <laughs> <laughs> and who knows at some point probably eat it again but yeah. here we are here we are right now great gig here's the goulash now get out of here yeah. Get out of my venue. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, uh, oh God! Ch- cheers! Thanks for coming on. Um, I'm a bit all over the place today. Like I, I'm, I think I'm kind of I'm wired this week. I don't know. I, I got up at like six o'clock today. I'm just. I woke up at five today, so I'm with you. I, fo- I noticed that. I was like, he's emailing yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, man. I wake up early anyway, but today I woke up extra early. You always get up that early. Pretty much. I'm an early riser. It's my favorite time of day. I go down to the lake. We have a lake that's uh, just about two miles from our house. So I go down there every morning almost, pretty much every morning, and just watch the sunrise and watch the uh, – there's this bird. I think it's a crane or a egret or something mm-hmm. that just sits on this uh, um, dead tree sticking out of the water but he's there every day so i call him fred and we just hang out <laughs> <laughs> would you ever get into the ornithology bird watching you know uh probably not to the extent of those movies like that jack yeah. jack black movie and uh steve martin i can't remember the name of it but yeah, yeah i do I've, enjoy i've hung out with ornithologists because i did environmental science in college like and one of, oh, one cool. of the years we had to do bird watching and it, it, nice. it, it was it was funny like it was like when they e- e- egrets aren't in ireland that long they're kind of they only started coming here since it got a little bit warmer in the last 10 years so okay. like when this guy saw an egret he actually was acting like it was like a, a 61 p base or something he was losing <laughs> his mind i was like yeah it's a nice bird all right <laughs> that's great yeah, but sure no everyone has their thing don't they that they get into yeah man yeah but so yeah i'm looking forward to you know touring again um there's some more um daughtry songs that are going to come out as well that uh i've played on um and then the zenith divine stuff and i'm you're just keeping, you're just keeping busy just trying to stay busy man but keep what you're do- doing what you're doing online because uh you keep me entertained anyway and a lot of other people it's just all right you're positive like you're, you're you are a very positive guy Thank you, man. I try to stay, stay up, stay positive, and stay humble, and that's what you do. Like, it's great. Well, I appreciate that, man. 
we're very self-deprecating in Ireland. But we we are we try to be positive, but we're not. <laughs> yeah. We could learn a bit of that off, the, off you guys over in America. Uh, well, I think I think you just need a little bit more sunshine, and, and <laughs> yeah. that will help. Yeah, that would actually be that would be nice. So we can't go on holidays at the moment to go get some sunshine. Yeah. Right. Uh, so yeah. the, hopefully the pubs will open up for Christmas and we can get some Guinness because uh, when you get a can of Guinness, <laughs> when you get a can of Guinness, it has a thing in it called uh, widget. It has like, yeah. ni- has nitrogen in it. It's yeah, little, it's a little ball. Actually, a guy invented it who drinks Guinness. He contact uh, this could be an urban myth, but like he was drinking the cans. He's like these are crap. So we contacted him and said you should put a little widget in it to make oh. the head rise. But anyway, yeah. because of COVID, they can't source the widgets. So wow. no one in Ireland can have a Guinness at the moment because all what? the pubs are closed and yeah. there's no widgets in the cans. <laughs> We're all like, damn it. We can't have a Damn Guinness. It. <laughs> this is the worst. <laughs> you thought 2020 was bad, and now we can't even have a pint of Guinness. My God. What is going on? <laughs> <laughs> this is the real problem. Well, cheers, dude. Yeah, no bother, man. <laughs>